This is totally unrehearsed, okay? <laughs> Are we ready to, to go? Okay, good. Troy? So we're going to talk about what it means to be battle ready. So I'll start out with a war story. Uh, some people who have, I've just signed the book, said, we haven't read the book yet, but when you read it, you'll see some of the things that we're talking about will make more sense as we go through there. So uh, how many in here have ever thought they were actually ready for the day and didn't think anything expected. Remember that last story about Saturday morning? Well, I have another one. In fact, I can tell you this. I should have been dead a number of times, brothers and sisters. The only reason I'm here is because God said, I'm not done with you. In fact, here's what I will tell you. You are immortal until God tells you to come home. Before that, you know, a lot of people will say this and that. I would just say this about COVID and everything else. If it's not your time, it's not your time. But if it is your time, no one's going to stop you from going home. So it was about 2005. I'm in Victory Base, Iraq. Anybody been to Iraq? Anybody here been to Iraq? Okay. Uh, it's not one of the world's destination vacation spots. In fact, there's a sign that oh, when I was in Honduras, this was the best sign I've ever read because they used to sign up to go on Black Hawk helicopter flights to different uh, bases uh, throughout Central America. And it says, we take more people places they don't want to go than any other airline in the world. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I'm in um, Iraq Victory Base, which is... Uh, close to uh, the capital, through Baghdad. It's by the International Airport. We call it Biop. The, but uh, in those days, it was the you know, Saddam Hussein International Airport. And we have just taken it over. And I'm over there. And uh, every morning, you, you know, in the military, like everything else, even combat, you have routines, right? You get up in the morning. In the morning in the Army, they paid us to get physically fit. So every morning I'd get up and I'd run and I'd do exercises, 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. By the way, as retired, I don't do that anymore. I just want to <laughs> let you know. I never liked getting up in the, in the morning early. That was not my thing. A lot of people do. I, I like to go to bed late, but everybody's got their battle rhythm. I'm in the morning, and every morning when I'm running, there's lots of soldiers running the perimeter. The perimeter is just a wall that goes all the way around Victory Base. And every 50 yards, there's a machine gun tower. You know, it's highly secured, Constantiner wire. You're pretty safe inside the wire. That's what we call it, inside the wire. But this particular morning was different. Um... So I'm out there running at 5.30. We call it Oh Dark 30, and I'm running. And there's a few things that I begin to notice. They're not the same. First of all, I'm the only one running out there. Now that in itself should have gave you a clue. Something was amiss. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe they're on an exercise or whatever. You know, you don't really. But then... Other things become to come into play like someone's watching me. I mean, I had this sense someone had eyes on me. I've never had it before, and I've never had it since, but I felt like someone was watching me, and I couldn't shake it. I'm running along. There's nobody out there, and then our battalion uh, personnel director or captain, he's a Hispanic fellow. 
and I'm, I'm married to a Hispanic lady, Esther, 41 years, by the way, uh, this year, 42 in October. And uh, by, and, by and large, Hispanics, especially from Mexico, are normally brown, right? Brown color. Uh, this guy was white as this wall. I'm looking at him and go, man, this guy, how, what do you do, change color overnight? <laughs> no, he's screaming at me, chaplain. And as soon as he said that, a bullet was right over my head and hit the palm tree behind me, and birds flew out of it. He said, there's a sniper over in the minaret, and he's gunning for you. The same thing, the same time, all this happens all at the same time. These two Marine helicopters, thank God for the Marines, they come over the wall. I didn't even know they were there. They're coming over the wall, and they fire this guy up, man. Just cut that plane, that minaret in half and kill everybody up there. He's dead. And uh, I'm thinking, what just happened to me? I almost died because I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't vigilant. I wasn't battle ready, although I thought I was. I didn't read the signs of the times. I didn't know that because no one was out there. And I didn't know a lot of things that in hindsight I began to figure out I shouldn't have been out there in the first place. I didn't get the memo from the command that no one should be running the perimeter wall that morning because there was danger out there. And so when you talk about becoming battle ready, which we're going to talk about right now, the first thing that people I would tell you is this, watch and pray. Be vigilant. Because your enemy, Satan, is after your soul. And he, it says in 1 Peter 5.8, and we'll have that up there in a minute, it says in 1 Peter 5.8, that he goes around like a roaring lion after you. He's after you. And he wants you not to make heaven. And he doesn't want you to be a warrior for God. And he wants to cause chaos and confusion and distractions in your life. In South Korea right now, we have a division. And their motto is, fight tonight. You know why? Because at any given moment, they're going to be in battle with North Korea. North Korea has 13,000 artillery tubes pointed at Seoul, Korea. And within 30 seconds or less, they will hit once they fired them. So we could be at war in Korea within the next minute. And I asked a general officer, four-star commander, uh, one time when I was over there, I said, sir, what would happen if we got in war with North Korea? How long would it last? He said about seven to ten days. And he said millions of people would die. It would be intense. It would be short. And probably, he said, we'll go nuclear. So on the world that we live in, although we get up and we love routine and we love, you know, all those things that we're used to, remember one thing. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to anybody. It's not promised. Except... The Lord says he holds tomorrow in his hand. So whether we live or die, we are Christ. And so Paul said, whether I, for me to live and for me to die is gain and for me to live is Christ. So either way, whether I live in the body or I live in heaven, I'm going to be Jesus Christ. And it's really important for us that right now to understand that becoming battle ready means Every moment of every day that we're in tune with what God is telling us, we're in tune with his word, we're in tune with prayer, we're in tune with the powers of the Holy Spirit that want to use you. You know what? The reason why the apostles of the first century were so powerful, because they believed that God would do miracles, that God would do healing, and it's, they were in the supernatural presence and power of God every moment. And they did miracles, and they saw miracles, and they lived miracles because they believed that the Lord that was in them was a miracle-working God. And I think a lot of people are so fed up with nominal Christianity, they don't really, the, the, the current generation doesn't think the church can do anything. It's because the church hasn't done anything. 
Until now, we got to get battle ready. We got to walk out these doors and we got to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we got to believe in all the things the Bible says. The Bible says that we will do these miracles, that we have, we have the gift of healing, that we have the gift of miracles, that we have the gift of these powers that God has given us, but we're not using them. Amen. I'm just warming up. Troy, take over. I don't have any war stories, <laughs> but I do have some reporter stories. And, and uh, I remember on, on 9-11, I remember we lived in uh, Claremont, California, and, uh, you know, downtown L.A. is about 30, 40 miles away. And so I, I wake up, and on TV we're watching the, the you know, the Twin Towers uh, burn in, in, in New York City. And I get a call from my editor, he says, Troy, Get to downtown L.A. immediately as fast as you can because people are streaming out of the skyscrapers in downtown L.A. because they're afraid they're going to get hit, too. And so I, I drive as fast as I can to get to downtown L.A. And, you know, I start interviewing everybody and, you know, they write a story. But, you know, of course, L.A. didn't get hit. But it's, it's, never, it's never that time. It's a time of, like, a lot, a lot of tension and stuff. And so a couple of days later, there is a, a, a report of some kind of gas that's released in, in the subway system in L.A., and they don't know what it is. And so my editor calls me. She goes, Troy, there's been a release of possibly poison gas in the subway system. Get down there and interview people. And I'm like, what, what if it's really poisonous gas? What if I die? She's like, I don't care. Get down there and interview people. And so, you know, I went down there and interviewed people, you know, because otherwise I would lose my job. Uh, but that's, that's sort of like, you know, as a reporter, you know, you got to be ready to, you know, go cover for pretty much anything. You know, of course, war correspondents, you know, really put their lives on the line. But, you know, so that, that's sort of my, my experience with being battle ready is you, we never know what's going to happen in life. You never know, you know, anything can happen at any time. And so it's important to be trained and vigilant, you know, study the Bible, pray, be in contact with the Lord, you know, at all times. The Bible says pray without ceasing. And so these are some of the kind of things that are necessary in life to be battle ready, to be successful, to be, to be victorious. And the whole purpose of the Military Guide to Armageddon and, and Battle Ready Ministries is to help you walk in the supernatural power, protection, and provision of the Holy Spirit, which is going to be critical to move in, you know, as we go into end time events. So funny story. Do, do you guys know who Jesse DePlantis is? You do, probably. Uh, he's an evangelist on TV. Funnier, funny, hilarious guy, but loves the Lord. But it's, it, the story really is um, about being battle ready at all times because you never know. If something as, as, as small as a dinner can turn into a really big event. So Jesse just got through preaching a big crusade and he was invited by a couple to come to his house. And Jesse doesn't normally do that, but he just kind of felt led of the Lord. The Lord says, go with them. And this lady is bragging to Jesse, I make the best seafood gumbo in Louisiana. And that's saying something, right? Louisiana is the seafood gumbo capital of the world. So he's thinking, man, this is going to be great. So they get to the house. They're sitting at the dinner table. And the lady goes in the kitchen to prepare. And the husband and the kids aren't saying. They're just staring at him. They're staring at him. Like, he's thinking, this is strange, Mike. What are they staring at? She brings out the gumbo. And she, you know, gives it. And the husband continues to stare at him. And the kids are staring at him to see what he's going to do. So he eats it, and immediately he says to himself, this is horrible. And the lady's looking at him and saying, what do you think? Isn't that great? The husband's looking at him. You're talking about being in battle. So the Lord's speaking to him. The Lord is speaking to him. He says, tell the lady it's garbage. He goes, I ain't doing that. He says, this is hilarious. He says, Lord, you're up in heaven. You can do whatever you want. I'm down here in reality. <laughs> he says, I ain't telling you. The Lord says, tell the lady it's garbage. And he's like, really? This is all coming in real time, right? He's really struggling and fighting with it. Finally, he says, he goes, she goes, what do you think? He says, it's garbage. <laughs> the man jumps up who hadn't been to church and says, hallelujah, I'm giving my life to Christ. <laughs> Because you're the first one to tell my wife the truth. And I believe you, preacher. And he and his whole family got saved. <laughs> it pays to listen to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we miss it all the time. And a lot of people say, well, how do you know it's God? Listen, 
the, Jesus said it simply, my sheep will hear my voice. If you're a follower of Christ, he is going to speak to you. Amen. There's a big sign on my bedspread that says, be still and know I am God. We get all jitterpated and we get all bent out of shape because nothing's happening. And the Lord says, wait on me. And we go and try to fix it ourselves. You ever been there? Yeah, go fix it yourself. Well, I've tried to fix it myself a lot of times. Be alert. Be vigilant. Be a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for you to devour. And that's what 1 Peter 5, 8, and this is why we're calling this, this thing battle ready. I want to read to you what John Piper said that I think is really, really important. Uh, and it's in the book, too. <clears throat> and, Pastor, you're gonna, I think you're going to love this. And so is the whole church. Satan is satisfied with all of our religious activity. I want to say that one more time. By the way, Satan is, knows what's happening. He's in the church. He comes to church with you. He's here right now. Uh, that's why we rebuke him every chance we get. Satan is satisfied with all of our religious activity as long as it does not move us to break down the gates to rescue the perishing. Therefore, at the top of my agenda these days has been the question, how can I get myself and the church awake to a wartime mentality? Billy? A, a battle-ready believer is willing to obey and follow hard after God in every area of life. They are team-centered, not me-centered, mission-oriented, and spirit-filled. They're prayer warriors, trained in the weapons of spiritual warfare, gifted and empowered, disciplined and courageous, ready to do battle with the forces of this present darkness. For a man or woman of God to be effective in the kingdom of God, they must be properly equipped. The Apostle Paul explains in Ephesians 6 how a man or woman of God should be arrayed in armor for spiritual warfare. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, and you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of this darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Amen. You know, we read that scripture a lot, but m most people don't have a clue what it means. They, they, oh, yeah, I got the full armor of God, but they don't know how to use the armor of God. They don't know what the armor of God is really for, and uh, they have a hard time to figure out how that translates into real life. Well, we're going we're gonna to explore that today. Um, so if I go to the next slide, the number one priority of our military is right there ahead of you. Readiness. It is the ability to be prepared to fight in any place, anytime, anywhere, anyhow, at a moment's notice. That's the Army's number one priority. It's the military's number one priority. And someone came up to me the other day and asked me, he said, you know, in the book you say, you know, there's a motto that says um, readiness uh, or the, uh, battle or uh, Battle always, really, is the, is the term. Battle always, or operational always, and people first. What does that mean? It means this, that the mission of the army is the most important thing that will ever happen. So it's mission first. Whatever the mission is, takes over. If a, if a commander tells you, take that hill and hold it at all costs, that means you're going to go on that hill probably die. Because that's the mission. What does it mean, people first? It means we train our people. 
we care for our people, we feed our people, we indoctrinate our people, we train our people, but the mission comes first. And the mission that Jesus Christ has given us, he said, go into all the world and make disciples in all the world. That's the mission. Okay? And so we're part of that. We're, we're going around making disciples. The army's mission is to win the war at all costs, wherever, wherever we go. And by the way, there's a book called America First Battles, where it was required reading in the Army War College. And in that book, it talks about all the battles from a revolutionary war all the way to now. America's lost every first battle. From the invasion of North Africa, World War II, the I Drang Valley in Vietnam, on and on it goes. We've lost every, you know, you know why? We weren't ready. You see, Congress, even now, even today, they're taking money from the military and they're giving it to other programs. They're giving it to other things. And it's, it's been like that for 200 years in the, in, the, in the United States of America. The fact of the matter is, when you take money out of the military and you don't do the training, proper training, you don't have the proper equipment, you're going to lose. And so we learned over those years that uh, if we're not ready, we're going to lose. Well, it's the same in the Christian life. If we're not ready, we're going to lose. If we're not vigilant, we're going to lose. If we're not prepared, we're going to lose. Now, we may end up in heaven, and uh, the Lord will take care of us, but what do you want to say on the judgment seat of Christ when the Lord tells, asks you, how did you complete your assignment? You know, what did you do with your life? How did you take my gospel and my, my relation with you? And what did you do on my behalf? How did you fulfill it? And so I want to be able to stand on judgment and say, Lord, I did everything that you required me. And I did it to the best of my ability. I wasn't perfect, but here it is. I want the Lord on that good day to say to all of us, well done, good and faithful servants. You were, you were faithful in the little things. Welcome to the heaven and to the big things. But first, before we get there, we have to be battle ready. You, you know, you may, you may be asking yourself, you know, why, why do I need to get battle ready? Why would it be a good idea to, to read the military guide to Armageddon, to come to a conference like this? Um, you know, one thing, I, uh, several years ago, my wife suggested that I start keeping a log, a, a journal of things. I call it the log of supernatural miracles and phenomena. And so in, in early 2016, every time I'd pray, and then it seemed like that God would intervene in my life and something miraculous would happen. I'd write it down in my log. And so th this, this journal's now grown to, I think it's 150 pages with 250 entries in it of essentially miracle after miracle after miracle over the last, uh, you know, four years. Well, when, I, when I opened up uh, today, I told you that, you know, we came here in uh, September 2019 and everybody came forward and prayed for a National Day of Repentance. We hadn't had one since Abraham Lincoln was president. America's been unrepentant for a century and a half. And then, you know, God used Kevin Jester, a friend of mine, who wrote the White House Executive Summary. You know, we, we persuaded Rabbi Khan to be the spokesman, and an event happened. It's a, you know, it's a gigantic miracle. A quarter million people got saved. Pa Pastor Greg Laurie, he said last year 150,000 people came to the Lord via his ministry because of everybody was, you know, concerned about, you know, co coronavirus and what's going on. And, and Pastor Rick Ward, he just came out uh, last week, so like 60,000 people came to the Lord. So that, that's the power of prayer. You know, God, God will intervene in our lives in gigantic ways. I, we just got a phone call the other day from, uh, he's, he's the, uh, the partner of the executive producer of Braveheart and the Passion of the Christ. He called and said, hey, Troy, I heard about the military guide to Armageddon. You know, he asked me to send him a copy. We, we, you know, there's a possibility it might be turned into a movie. You know, these, these are all just gigantic miracles, way over my pay grade. And, and so that, that's the power of prayer. That's the power of being battle ready, you know, drawing close to God and, and learning how to walk in the, you know, supernatural power of the Lord. It amazes me that believers and Christians, um, a lot of them tell me this. I think you might relate to this, but they say, we don't really want to hear from the Lord, honestly. And, and he, you know why? Because a lot of them say, if I hear from the Lord, he may make me do something I don't want to do. Have you heard this, Pastor? A lot of times in my leadership experience in churches, I never ask congregations, by the way, if they want to. I just go up to a person, hey, you're going to do this right over here. And normally they would comply with that because 
You know, they didn't want to say no to the pastor. Uh, but if you ask for volunteers, nobody can volunteer for anything. That's just like in the military. Nobody volunteers for anything. Uh, that's one of our mottos. Don't volunteer for anything. Um, so yeah, let me uh, change the slide here. So Army readiness principles. And let me tell you another story. That I think these stories are really powerful because it's not just about me, but it's about really being battle ready and being prepared. And so uh, my first assignment, Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso. Anybody has been in El Paso here? Yeah. Uh, it's a great place to be from. <laughs> if you like wind and dust and dirt, it's a great place to go. Uh, and I, I experienced a lot of it out in the back McGregor Range out at Fort Bliss. It's hot, snakes, tarantulas, wind, you know, all name it. And I saw so I was in a unit called Patriot. Patriot was a, is a missile system designed to shoot down airplanes and to shoot down other missiles. And we were deployed to Desert Storm to protect the king's oil fields in Saudi Arabia. And I spent a lot of time... Uh, traveling the roads of, of other deserts, especially. So El Paso got me ready for a desert storm, you know. <coughs> uh, no question about it. So my commander comes to me one day. We're out in the field, and we have these units, you know, these missile silos set up, and our units are protecting it in case the enemy tried to, uh, you know, flank us or destroy our position. So we're practicing you know, readiness out in the field. We're practicing like we're real war. It works, you know, real time, real time training. So this commander comes to myself and he says, he said, look, chaplain, you're the only one in the unit can get around to all of the places. You have a vehicle. You have an assistant. Here's some crates and caseloads, as much as you want, of pyrotechnics. You can have smoke grenades. You can have, uh, you know, things that blow up in the air, artillery simulators, anything you want. We're going to fill your vehicle up. And I want you to go around at night, and I want you to attack our perimeters. I said, really? I said, this sounds like a lot of fun, you know? So, and there's, there's sand dunes, so you can hide behind sand dunes when you get to the perimeter. He said, I want you to test the readiness of my unit. I want, you to, I want to see how they're going to react. They don't have real bullets, by the way. They have tracers. They have other things, that, you know, that make loud noises. But none of the things they have is going to kill you, so that's good. So I get to the I get to the out first unit, and you can hear them. You know they're buzzing around and they're preparing, and the units, the missiles are there, and the radar units and the command, and there's about a hundred soldiers per you know circle uh, encircled around, and they're protecting their equipment. And it's nighttime, and I'm we're behind a sand dune, and I'm laying in the sand, and my assistant's right next. to says, "Are you ready to fire these guys up?" He goes, "Yes, sir." I said, well, let's fire for effect. And we just unloaded on these guys. We threw smoke grenades. We threw pyrotechnics in the air. And, you know, they have flares coming down and lights up the whole night sky. It looks like the 4th of July is going off. And you can hear them, you know, behind the sand dude running around. And they're starting to fire every position, every way, you know. And they're, uh, they're really just, they're on the radio. You hear them, you know, da, 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 da. There's, there's enemies out there. There's, you know, I can hear them say, there's a whole company of soldiers. It's just two of us. There's all company soldiers out there. They're attacking our perimeter. Get them ready. Fire for effect. And everything is going to uh, Hades in the handbasket. That's the nice way of saying it. And I'm laughing my head off. And my assistant, we're having a lot of fun. We go to the next place, and we do the same thing. And then we're going to get ready on the third. We're going all night. We're going from place to place to place. We're, I said, we're testing their readiness. What I didn't know was these guys got on the radio and talked to their fellow units and said, hey, there's folks coming your way. So what they did is they sent out roving patrols. And I'm sitting, I didn't know this. I'm sitting behind the third berm. I'm, you know, we're getting ready to fire up. And I look up and there's a gun barrel right at my head. And they said, okay, dudes, you're caught. And they bound us up and roughed us up and, you know, threw us into their perimeter and interrogated us. And uh, they knew it was the chap and the chap assistant. But so that was the end. But. The whole, the whole point of the story is this. You never know. You know, Satan is a um, master of chaos and confusion, and he's going to test your perimeters. You know, after this battle-ready conference, get ready because you're going to be tested. And, there, you know, Satan is not going to take all of this lying down. He is going to 
you know, come after you, and we have to know that that's going to happen, and so vigilant is going to be key every moment, every day. Lord, what would you have me to do? Get on the net. Call other people. Say, hey, pray for me. Let's go to church. Let's get battle ready because things are happening out there, and things are coming our way. As Americans, you know, we've had it for good for so long that we've taken for granted the freedoms and freedoms that our founding fathers and the military secured for us over the, over the centuries. You know, as recently as five years ago, who, who would have thought that prominent social media platforms would silence many Christians through, through censorship, mm -hmm. cancellation, and deplatforming? Today, as believers, we're facing increasing censorship and the threat of being canceled by the cancel culture. Uh, just, just this week, a, a lady that's got about 200,000 uh, YouTube subscribers, she, she announced that she'd been deplatformed. And, uh, you know, we've gone on her show in the past, and she does a great job of telling the truth. So there's, there's all kinds of different people we know in sort of the Bible prophecy community that are getting taken off YouTube. And they, Kevin Sorbo had right. half a million followers on uh, Facebook, and he said the wrong thing, and they just took him off, you know. Um, <coughs> so th this is a new form of spiritual warfare that we haven't encountered before. And uh, so wh why is this cancel culture on the rise? Uh, well, you know, it benefits the enemies of America and, and freedom. And uh, those who benefit from the council culture are those who want to remake the world and America into a one-world socialist system. Uh, this is the vision that you know uh, John Lennon you know, talked about in the song Imagine. And my great-grandfather plus uh, poet and playwright Frederick von Schiller, he described this as the brother of brotherhood of man in his poem Ode to Joy. You know, this, this is a vision that goes back for you know, centuries, if not you know, thousands of years. You know, pe people believe we can create this utopia on earth. We can create, uh, uh, you know, heaven on earth. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Klaus Schwab here uh, recently. He's the, the founder of the World Economic Forum, who announced the Great Reset of Capitalism. Uh, you know, after he did that last summer, uh, Time Magazine featured the Great Reset on its cover. Prince Charles announced the world has a golden opportunity to see something good from this COVID-19 crisis involving big visions of change. Uh, and, um, you know, cr critics have warned that the, the Great Reset is a radical plan to usher in global socialism. Justin Hawkins at, at the Heartland Institute, he wrote, The Great Reset is the Green New Deal on steroids, and its purpose is to move the world economy towards socialism using climate change and COVID-19 as the justification. Yeah, this thing about climate change. So, so COVID is kind of coming to an end. We see the handwriting on the wall. We see that. Oh, the mask and the, uh, you know, the inoculations and all that. But this climate change is the next thing that they're going to hang over our heads, aren't they, Troy? And the government's going to say, well, you know, we're not over yet. You know, the world's going to end because we're going to be drowned in the water because, you know, the earth's going to heat up. So tell me more about what do you think about climate change and what, how are they going to affect us in the end time? Yeah, so the, the Great Reset is, you know, closely tied in with the, the, the sort of the climate change agenda. Supposedly, the, you know, the wor Earth is warming, we, you know, and, you know, like you might have heard uh, AOC talk about uh, we're all going to get drowned in 12 years and, you know, as the, as the seas, you know, cover us all and, and such. And so it's all sort of tied together. The, the elite want to save the endangered species. We've got to, you know, we've got to, you know, reduce the emissions in our cars and, uh, you know, do this great reset, move into smaller homes, not own property. Uh, this, you know, it's the United Nations Agenda 2030, which is on their website, details everything they want to do over the next 10 years. So they have a, a, a definite, or I guess a nine-year plan now to, to roll this out. So it's all the climate change, the great reset, this push towards socialism. It's all part of this concerted plan that the, the elite are uh, rolling out now. Right. And so um, being vigilant now, I was, uh, this, I'm not telling you these things to scare you, okay? I'm telling you these things because I want you to be ready and prepared. Dr. Tom Horn uh, of Skywatch TV and I had a conversation when we were there in Missouri. He's written a book called The Messenger and Wormwood. Um, and so the story is another thing to be vigilant about. So um, I told my wife, I said, you know what? We've been working hard. We've been talking about the end times. Let's get away from all that for right now. And we're going to go down to NASA 
and Kennedy Space Center. We're going to have a good time down there. We're going to tour. We're going to relax. And we're not going to worry about the end times. We're not going to worry about all the stuff we've been really been talking about. So what happens? I go down to NASA, and we have those movie theaters. You know those movie theaters, 3D? Um, they're a big screen, 3D. I forgot what they're called, but what is it? Yeah. So it's a big, and so I'm sitting there, and then it opens up, and it's in space. It's NASA, and there's this big rock, and it's floating in space. And the first thing the announcer says, there is an asteroid headed toward Earth that will destroy the planet. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, I can't get away from it, right? So Tom Horn, Dr. Tom Horn, died when he was a young man, a young preacher. Uh, he woke up after the Lord had showed him the entire future. He went to heaven, showed him everything that was going to happen to this planet. But then he took, he showed him that, and then he took his memory away and said, I'm only going to show you a little time because I don't want your life to get all messed up by following all these things. So the Lord reveals things to him a little bit at a time. Well, the Lord revealed to him a couple of years ago that the, uh, the, the uh, Pope was going to retire in April 2018 or whatever the Pope retired, and it didn't happen, right? And in the year, nothing happened. In the beginning of the next year, Vatican reveals that the Pope retired in April of the previous year, just like the Lord had said, but it had not been revealed. Then the Lord gave him this uh, vision of this asteroid headed toward planet Earth. And I hate to tell you this, brother, but the Lord showed him it's going to hit off the coast of California. In 2029, April 13th, that's what he's, you know, envision, has envisioned. And uh, then I went on the NASA website and I looked at all this. This asteroid name is Apophis, right? Apophis is the Egyptian word the, of, the, of their god named destruction. And so destruction is headed toward us uh, at going at 30,000 miles an hour, weighs 40 million tons. And if it does hit... In the Pacific Ocean, you can imagine the destruction that's going to happen. And so, and then Dr. Horn says, you know, that 2029, April 13th, it could be that we're in the middle of the Great Tribulation. I don't know. And I don't know if this thing is going to hit. That's what he's saying. He's predicting. He's prophesying. The Lord is showing him. But NASA initially said that this rock is going to hit the earth at that time. And then they said, oh, no, they changed their minds. They said it probably misses by 20,000 miles. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 20,000 miles in astronomical terms is minutia, right? And, and he knows a lot of people in, in NASA, and he said that the fact of the matter is this, that they're covering that up. They don't really want the public to, to know what's really going on. And so they're forming these teams around the world. So it happens this week, and they're getting ready to discuss – what they can do if, a, if an asteroid were to hit our planet. All that to say this, we have to be continually vigilant because we don't know. We have to watch and we have to pray and we have to come very serious about our relationship with Christ. The time of playing church has been over for a long time, but as we get closer as you begin to see the things that are happening on our planet, it's time to get battle ready. It's time to get vigilant, which we're going to talk about specifically here in just a few moments. But there are so many things to be aware of. Another thing I would share with you about the end times. So people ask me all the time on TV and radio just yesterday, what do you think is the next event going to happen on this planet? I th personally think, uh, of course, we're headed toward globalization. We're headed to all these other things. But keep your eyes on Israel. You know, when the Lord comes back, he's going to step on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to split in two. It says that in the Old and the New Testament, that he's coming back. That's where he's coming back to. That's the center of gravity. That's where everything is happening is Israel. And in that moment, you know, people are going to realize they've been wrong all along. What I believe is going to happen here fairly soon is the Jews are going to build their third temple 
on that mount, Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which they haven't been able to do. And everybody says up to this point, it's impossible, can never happen, because the Islam has control of that Temple Mount, and you can't build a temple there. But it's happening. I mean, it is happening slowly but surely. In fact, Saudi Arabia in the last few weeks says, let's give the Temple Mount back to the Jews. Let's release control. We have Medina and Mecca. They just caught Islam playing a soccer f- game on that Temple Mount, that holy near the Holy Shrine. And Jews pointed that just the other day and said, look at this. These guys are not taking this seriously. Get us over there. We want to be in charge and we want to build our temple. And ladies and gentlemen, when they build that temple, you say, so what? The so what is when the Antichrist comes to power, it says in the Bible, he's going to go to that temple and he's going to proclaim himself to be God. And you, we must worship him as God. That's the significance that's going on right now. You, you know, the, the, what the colonel said about this asteroid brought something to mind. Um, when... Uh, when I first began, you know, investigating all this, are we, are we really moving into these end time events? I, I did as much reading as I possibly could. I read Tom Horn's books. I read pretty much all the books out there. I interviewed all these prophecy guys. I did tons and tons of research, a decade of research looking into all this. And what, what's happened, I mean, last year, we like, like our neighbors you to mention, there's all these so-called prophets. We're all saying Trump's going to get reelected, right? You may have all heard about that. And there's dozens of people out there saying that. But I, I kept on, I, I told Paul McGuire, I go, he's in trouble. <laughs> you know, he's probably not going to get reelected. But nobody wanted to hear that message. And we've, we've had many comments uh, that things we wrote in the Babylon Code and Trumpocalypse and now the Military Guide to Armageddon, it's happened. You know, th- things we wrote back in 2015 began to transpire. And then the Lord put me in touch with the colonel here. And he told me, you know, in 2018, by the time this book came out, it would be a completely different world. It is. He also told us that there's more things coming. And uh, so, you know, it's very important to get the, the gift of discernment to sort of navigate all the information that's out there today because there's so much deception and, and uh, you know, misinformation that's coming down. So uh, that, that's one of the reasons why it's very important to really study the Word of God very, very closely at this time as we move into these events because you're going to need really keen discernment to understand what's really happening because there's so much lying going on especially in the media and, and Hollywood. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, we're going to get ready to go into another uh, session here. We're going to give you a, a moment or two to stretch, and we're going to let you ask a few questions. But before we do that, uh, what do we need to do right now to become battle ready? Well, here are three principles right out of the book that I want to share with you that I really want you to take to heart and I really want you to look at and think about, pray about, and Im- implement in our lives. Number one uh, you know, Romans 12, 2 says we need to have our minds transformed. Have you ever read that before? <laughs> what does that really mean? Um, there's a lot of books written about minds and transformation. But the fact of the matter is, if our mindset right now is one of ease and of just doing whatever we want to do and just being comfortable, we need to change that mindset into becoming a warrior for God. What do I need to do? You know, believers need to seek the Lord always and re- be renewed every moment. The, I told uh, my wife the other day, if someone asks me to do something, whether a concert or, or a, a conference or preach or anything, I'm going to ask the Lord about it first. And that's what really should our, be our mindset about everything we do. Lord, what do you think I should do about this situation? It could be your finances, it could be in your work, it could be in your relationship to him, it could be in your relationship to each other, and to the, your wife, your spouse, your girlfriend, but whatever it is. Lord, like David inquired of the Lord before he went to battle, every time he inquired. And when he didn't inquire is when he lost the battles. So we need to be talking to the Lord like he's our best friend and inquire of being transformed of our mind. So, Lord, renew my mind today and get me into that mindset of a warrior. Get me the mindset of a recruit that first comes to basic training and that we translate their world from civilian to military from the very first day of basic training. So, you know, we tell people continuous training. Hebrews 10, 25 says, as the day goes, comes closer, don't forsake, forsake each other. Don't forsake the assembling of each other with each other. B- 
be together, study together, trade together, and, and, and do the word together. And then this advanced spiritual warfare, you know, that t second Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, you know, we need to seek advancement in, in God and get beyond the basics. You know, it's time to get beyond the milk. It's time to get into the studying the depths of the word of God, knowing about the end times, about prayer, about godly leadership, about walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. We always leave the Holy Spirit out like it's not important. It is the most important thing that we could do is being led it's the Bible says, if you are led by the Spirit of God, then you are a son of God. And so that's the, the, the readiness principles that we need to uh, abide by as we get battle ready and we get transformed. I'm going to stop here real quick and uh, just ask, you know, and we're going to take a break here in two or three minutes before our next session. Um, any comments, questions, queries? Brother Moses, hit us with your best shot, brother. Yeah, what I was going to say about the reading of the book of Revelation is this. Give that brother his, the microphone. I just see that as a, uh, a major factor as we move toward the end that we come in a full understanding that the presence of God with us now to deal with all that we deal with is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us day and night, and the Father is seated. And the Holy Spirit is here resident with us. So we uh, stay in fellowship with the Holy Spirit by being transparent with God Amen. and uh, doing exactly what we say. <laughs> Amen, brother. Uh, you know, you've said it all, so I'm just agreeing with you and and uh, putting that in as a word. God has so clearly spoken into my heart. Thank you for sharing that. Pastor, did you have a word? Yeah, I'm going to take a uh, five minute. Yeah, okay. that's a good word. All right, that's <laughs> a good word. Take yeah. a little break. Take five uh, minutes and come back. If uh, let's, let's try to get back in five minutes. If you want to run over real quick, we'll start at two o'clock. And use the restroom. It's in the other building. Um, but uh, get a little stretch break. Let's stand up and stretch a little bit. Give each other a little back massage. <laughs> Something there. <laughs> Jumping jacks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. that off of there.
<laughs> yeah, exactly. You need it all. <laughs> One of your parishioners came up. They came up and asked me, how much ammo do I need? I said, all of it. Are we ready to rock and roll? <laughs> All right, let's get started. Amen. All right. Hey, what happened to some of the other ones? Lee Herman, would you go over there and get those guys round up? All right, we're ready to get started. It reminds me of a story. Uh, I'm having chapel out in the desert. Remember I was telling you about going to the desert, Fort Bliss? And uh, 
I'm at the chapel. I mean, I'm, at, <laughs> I'm out in the desert having a service. And the first sergeant, the first sergeant is the senior enlisted powerhouse. If he tells you to jump, you just ask him how high. That's, that's who he is. He comes up to me before the service, about a half hour. He says, hey, chaplain, how many are you expecting to come out here to your service? I said, well, first sergeant, I don't know. He says, don't worry about it. About 30 minutes later, here comes the first sergeant with his entire company. He gave him a choice. He said, look, I'm going to give you a choice. You could stay here and dig foxholes, or you could go to service. <laughs> your choice. The whole company comes. All, you know, 100 men are coming down, and we had service with 100 guys out there. So those people who didn't come back right now, Pastor, you can assign them some of the funky details of church life. <laughs> Changing diapers in the uh, saying, I'm just kidding. Okay, so we're going to talk about the fog of war. So if you want to be a warrior for God, you're going to have to encounter, you will encounter some things in your life. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you didn't know what to do? I think you all should raise your hand, right? <laughs> in both hands. Have you ever been in a place in your life that you were confused? And have you ever been in a place in life where there's just chaos all around? And you're going, what am I finding myself in? Well, I found myself in that a couple of times, so I have a lot of stories. In fact, someone asked me, you know, because we're going to write another book, and our publisher wants war stories in every chapter. And they, I said, look, I can tell war stories now until the cows come home, because I, that's how many war stories I got. Uh, I got 30 years of military war stories. Fog of war. I'm in this unholy place called Hohenfels, Germany. Anybody been there? Ever been to Germany? So everybody thinks it's a beautiful place. It really is a beautiful place. I lived there for five years. By the way, I don't think there's a place on the planet I haven't lived here yet, you know, as after moving in the army for 30 years. And so we're in Hohenfels, Germany. Now, if there's ever a spot on the planet that God neglected, it's Hohenfels, Germany. Okay? Um, and I've been in some, some rough terrain. I was up in the tundra in Alaska, Central America, Asia. I mean, I've been all over the place. But this place was, the army picked it because they really are sadists at heart. They want you to suffer, you know, as much as you can in, in training. So we're there training, and we're on a tank battalion. We're fighting another tank battalion. But it's training. It's not actual combat. But they're getting as close to combat as you can. Well, if Hohenfels... I kid you not, in one day, every weather condition known to man happens in Hohenfels. Whether it's on one day, I kid you not, it would snow, rain, sunshine, wind, cold, hot, whatever it is. It happened during the day. Every few minutes, the weather changes. It's a mountainous area. And so we have been fighting all day in this war combat training, and we find ourselves coming back about one in the morning and it's foggy. I mean, you cannot see five feet in front of you. I tell my driver, stop. We're not going any further. Because how many know sometimes in the fog of life, it's better just to stop and wait on the Lord than try to do your own thing. That's why the Bible says, be still and know that I am the Lord. Well, we stopped for the night until it got light. And we didn't know where we were. We didn't know where our headquarters was. We didn't know exactly what was going on. So we stopped, and about 5 o'clock in the morning, got first light, I heard this. Knock on my door. It's an observer controller. The guys that are in control of all the training, making sure, you know, everything's going smoothly, and the war game is happening. He says, Chaplain, you got two choices. Okay, what's that? And I said, you could stay here and get killed, run over by those tanks that are about to run you over. Because if you look at back you, there's tanks, a whole line of 150 yards. In about 20 minutes, they're going to flatten you out because they, they didn't even know you're here. I said, what's my other choice? Is you can move out smartly. I think I'll take the second choice and move out smartly. And we found out we were only 150 yards away from our headquarters. And when chaos happens... And it's happening in our planet. Guess who's the master of chaos? You got it. And he is causing, the forces of hell have been unleashed on this planet. Causing, you've heard fake news, for example. 
Well, who's the author of fake news? Who's the author of mayhem, chaos, destruction, Satan? When every time you see someone lying or making things up or all the chaos, and you turn on the news. By the way, I have a, I have a suggestion. Turn the news off and live your life. Okay? Turn the news off and open your Bible. Turn the news off and talk to a friend. Turn the news off and listen to what the Lord is telling you. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't hear the news. There should be, you know, okay, you get that much news time. And most of you are going to hear is not true anyway. So I can't tell you who to believe and who not to believe because there's a lot of fakeness out there. There's fog out there. There's chaos out there. And in this session, we're going to help you Understand how the military navigates the fog of war and how you should navigate the fog of war. Um, when I was editor of uh, Charisma Magazine, we put together a, uh, an issue a few years ago that sort of demonstrates the, the fog of war, um, the fog of war that we're in today. I don't know if you can all see this, but uh, here on the cover of the magazine, you've got this, uh, this blood moon up here from a few years back, how it was the blood moons. We got this guy that's uh, 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 Antichrist uh, figure. He's got six 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 on his uh, on his forehead. Of course, ho ho hopefully he doesn't see his picture on here. And uh, you got the Tower of Babel. You got the the One World Trade Center in New York, and the EU building, which is actually designed to look like the Tower of Babel. And uh, the the headline we had is the Great Convergence: Blood Moons, the Shemitah, Rise of End Time Babylon, and the Antichrist. And so that was. Back in September of 2015, we put that together. And, uh, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, this magazine was, was released a month before my first book, The Babylon Code, Solving the Bible's Greatest End Times Mystery, came out. And at that time, many Christians were fascinated by the convergence of the blood moons, the biblical Shemitah, uh, which Rabbi Jonathan Kahn highlighted in his book, The Mystery of the Shemitah. And I wrote a cover story for that issue. It was called The End is Really Near. And uh, so I wrote The Signs, The Last of the Four Blood Moons, The Biblical Shemitah, Rise of End Time Babylon, The Dangerous Iranian Nuclear Deal, and a World Drowning in Debt and Dangling on the Edge of Economic Catastrophe seems unmistakable now. While harbingers of the apocalypse have been gathering for decades, most of the world has been largely oblivious to the gathering tempests and the prophetic warnings. This is changing with the sudden appearance of global instability, geopolitically, financially, and culturally, as the world undergoes a remarkably ominous transformation. Today, the world is facing a moral and social chaos, spiritual deception, proliferation of the occult, a spate of historic and natural disasters, worsening worldwide drought, record-breaking extreme weather, and the, even the growing risk of a nuclear conflagration. Franklin Graham, who, who I've interviewed, said, uh, he's president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, he says, the defining moment for America and humanity has arrived. As a nation, we have arrogantly turned our back on God, and I believe God's judgment will come against our country. You know, since that time, you know, we've progressed rapidly towards uh, judgment, and we've been in the fog of war. Since then, we witnessed what Rabbi Khan called a perfect prophetic storm as signs of the end of the days have accelerated and converged. And we believe that in the end times, this fog of war will increase. Life will become increasingly difficult, and decisions will be hard to make without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But God has given us the requisite power and authority to operate in this uncertainty. And following biblical principles will help you not only overcome the fog of war in the end times, but to walk in the supernatural blessings that God uh, promises us. So, with that... We study in the War College today Carl von Clausewitz, who is a Prussian general who actually worked for Napoleon Bonaparte. And he said something that was of utmost importance for us today. He said, war is the realm of uncertainty. And by the way, if you don't know it, we're at war. We've been war with Satan and the enemy forces for 6,000 years. And it's not going to stop anytime soon. And you're either on one side of that war or you're on the other. There is no middle ground. And he says three quarters of the factors on which action and war is based are wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. 
A sensitive and discriminating judgment is called for. A skilled intelligence is sent out the truth. Well, I think Paul said it the best. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly. We don't understand everything that's going on around us, but we do have someone the Lord has given us called the Holy Spirit, a person that will lead us and guide us and help us navigate in fact, I'd say the Holy Spirit is better than GPS. Because I was on GPS the other day, and it led me to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I trusted into my GPS, and uh, it let me down on a number of occasions. <coughs> the Holy Spirit will never let you down. But we have to be sensitive to what he is doing in our lives. So... Matthew 24, 23. Um, I told you we would talk about Matthew 24, and this is a portion of it. Now, let me set the stage for you. Jesus has just been raking over the Pharisees, the leaders of uh, the Jewish faith in Israel at that time. He was telling them things like, your father's the devil, you know, you're a brood of vipers. You're a bunch of whitewashed tombs. You know, things that really win hearts and minds of people. <laughs> and by the way, you know, this, this nonsense that Jesus loved everybody, and, and he did, but this business, Jesus is a hippie in a long robe and sandals and went around, you know, dancing through the tulips, you know, wouldn't do, hurt a fly, is absolutely false. That's not the Jesus who we serve. And the Jesus that's coming back as the king of kings and lord of lords is coming back on a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth to slay the Antichrist and all the forces are lined up against him. He says, at that time, <clears throat> meaning the end time, meaning now, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. There will be false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive you. Deceive us, if possible, us, the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So we interpret this passage that Jesus is talking about, that in the end times, there is going to be confusion and chaos and a lot of false. Anybody hear any false doctrines lately? Have you seen any false messiahs? Do you know that the Islamic world is waiting for their messiah to come back? Called the Mahdi. He's, they're waiting for him. And that's why Iran is causing all this stuff going on for all these years. All this chaos, terrorism. They want war to happen because they believe it will bring back their messiah. And they're, they're true. That, that is true. It will be, their messiah is the Antichrist, by the way. The Jews... Is, Almost the same thing. They're waiting for their Messiah to come back to the temple and proclaim himself to be God. Well, he's coming. He's called the Antichrist. <clears throat> Jesus said to these disciples, look, if anyone tells you I'm here or I'm there and I'm doing these great miracles. By the way, do you know the book of Revelation? I know your pastor just taught you this. The book of Revelation says the Antichrist in Revelation 13, will cause fire to come down from heaven in front of everybody. He will be raised from the dead. He will do miracles. He will cause a statue to speak and come alive. You're talking about a man with miraculous power that's Satan incarnate. That's the fog of war we're going to face in the future. You, you know, uh, 2 Thessalonians talks about a, a powerful delusion, better known <coughs> as the great deception that will occur uh, in the end times, we, we read in Second Thessalonians 2, 3 to 12, it says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for it will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, is revealed. He will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship, for he will seat himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things while I was still with you? And you know what is now restraining him, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now restrains it will continue until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, 
whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of his mouth and annihilate by the majesty of his arrival. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan, which with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder, and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing, because they refuse to, to hear, they, they refuse the love of the truth that would have saved them. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie in order that the judgment may come upon all who have disbelieved the truth and delighted in wickedness. And to today, with all the deception, all the false doctrines, other things we're seeing going on with this coronavirus, you know, it, it seems evident we may very well be moving into this powerful delusion that the Bible talks about. You know, it's not exactly clear what this delusion is going to be, but it's going to be so powerful and, and so convincing that the vast majority of the world is going to buy it and end up worshiping the Antichrist. So that's, that's one of the biggest reasons why you need to get battle ready is so you recognize what this deception is. Yes. And so you just mentioned here a lot of good, interesting things. It said, Paul also says that God is going to send them a delusion. Did you hear that? God is going to send a delusion because of why? They refuse to listen to the truth. You know, a lot of people, as I have grown older, I'm sure Pastor Jerry and your pastor has said, have thought too over these years, the more I get experience with God, the more I understand it, the less I understand God. Because God is way beyond, he's way complex. I, I'm glad he loves me and I'm glad I love him. But we will spend all of eternity trying to understand God. If you go to the Old Testament, there's a scripture that God is up in heaven with a council. He says, who will go for me to, to, to deceive the king and get him killed in battle? And one of the demons stands and says, Lord, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And the Lord says, go, you will be successful. Don't try to understand that, brothers and sisters. It just is, you know. And, and then there's other scripture that says, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Everybody tries to soften that up and say, well, you know, God allows of Pharaoh to do whatever he was because he was not a man after God. No, the Bible clearly says God hardened his heart so God could be glorified. That's something we really have to wrestle with and understand who God really is. You know, we were talking about love earlier, and I believe the Bible says God is love. But you know what? He's also a God of holiness and a God of judgment. And a God, you know, he's, there are multi-dimensions to God and so we cannot shoehorn and pin out to one particular thing. Well, this is God, because he's very, very complex and multidimensional. It says that God lives in all the dimensions of, at once. He lives from the past, the present, and the future all at once. He knows everything that's going to happen. And so when we talk about the fog of war, I want to talk about the U.S. military fog of war, and then I want to talk about you know, uh, us defining it and how to navigate it. The fog of war, <coughs> according to the military, is used as an acronym, VUCA, B-U-C-A, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambigu ambiguity. The U.S. Army War College introduced a concept of VUCA, according to General Thurman, which I knew him, uh, didn't know him personally, but I knew of him. You know, he describes the volatile, uncertain, complex, and multilateral world that emerged out of the Cold War. When you go to war, and we are in war right now, you know, the military loves to make plans. Have you ever made plans in your life? We love it. I worked in the Pentagon for four years, and the Pentagon is filled, vaults, full of plans. And those plans are wars in every country of the world, what we would do. There's only one problem, and every general, every colonel, every leader knows this. The plan goes out the window when the enemy starts shooting back at you. <laughs> the plans change. In fact, a friend of mine, uh, Colonel McChrystal, and his brother, you ever hear of General Stan McChrystal? Four-star general that was fired by President Obama. We won't go into that. But brilliant commander, 
he came in Iraq, and you know what he did? He found that none of the uh, units in the military were talking to each other. So nothing was getting accomplished, and the enemy was winning until he decided to put everybody in one building, and they could talk to each other. And they, then they started winning in real time because every time something happened, they would talk, and they would get things accomplished. <clears throat> the uncertainty and ambiguity of war is happening in our world, in our lives, in our marriages, in our churches. It's happening. There is chaos. Pastors are confused. I had uh, that leader the other day say, Chat, Colonel, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to tell their people. They have not been studied in the end times, and they're way behind the power curve. In fact, I was at a conference uh, training 150 pastors for a week up in North Georgia in October last year. And uh, in this conference, two pastors came up to him. They were Lutheran. And I, I finished all the stuff you're hearing today. And they came up and said, you know, Colonel, we love what you're saying, but we've never, ever, ever, ever heard anything like this. We don't know anything about the end times. Our church doesn't teach us about the coming of the Lord or anything that you're talking about. Where do we start? <laughs> I'm looking at them and I go, wow. These are pastors of churches. And I said, well, brothers, and I would tell you this, start with a good commentary on the book of Daniel. That's where I would start. Very conservative, evangelical look, because Daniel really spells out all the end times. And from there on, go to Zephaniah, go to Zechariah, go to Matthew 24, go to Luke 13. I mean, all these scriptures, Revelation. And they said, okay, we'll do that. So I don't know how they're faring right now, Pastor, but I, I hope them the best. But the fact of the matter is our pastors in our pulpits don't know what to do. And so we want to help them guide them through the fog of war. Brother? You, you know, uh, about two years ago, I, I went to a movie guide class. Uh, Jerry Moses here is assistant to the founder of Movie Guide. They took a, like a screenwriting class, helped me like learn how to you know write a screenplay. Now we're you know got the possibility of this movie going forward. And ever since then, Jerry and I have become great friends. In fact, he calls me about every day about eight o'clock, and uh, we do like a devotional, and he gives me some uh, mentorship, and it's just been a, a gigantic blessing. And uh, so that, that, that's one thing you could do is, is seek out somebody that uh, could be like sort of a, a spiritual mentor to you. And uh, it's not everybody gets you know, Moses to call him every day, but, uh, you know, God, God did that for me. So thank you very much. Brother, I'm jealous that Moses would talk to you every day. Oh, you mean Jerry Moses. I thought you meant real Moses. Okay. Well, Jerry, I'm jealous because you call him every day. But what am I, chopped liver? I don't get a call from Moses every day. <laughs> be obedient to the lord let me read a scripture to you exodus chapter 14 that will really help us understand this fog of war better in our lives uh and it's and at the bottom of the screen it says put yourself you know in the uh, hebrews place not your screen my screen but you're camped by the red sea and the strongest army on earth is marching after you after you've been delivered by God and you're there at the Red Sea, you have nowhere to go. Have you ever been there? Like you're parked at a place and there is no way out, left, right, up, or down. There's, you're just there. The Red Sea is in front of you and there is no way to go. So in Exodus 14, it says, the Hebrews were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say, have you heard this one? Guys, have you heard this from your wife? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I say, back in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egypt. They would rather be slaves than free. And you know what? There is a price to, pray, pray, to pay for freedom, by the way. Freedom is not cheap. It costs. Didn't we say to you, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And then Moses answered the people. Let's see if it's on our screen here. Yeah. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that will, will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never see again. 
Now, I'm going to get to preaching here in a moment. I can feel it just bubbling up in me. <laughs> the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I got in trouble one day. <clears throat> I was preaching this. I was in chapel. I was on active duty. And, of course, on active duty, you cannot be political. You have to be, you know. But I just came unglued one day because, don't take this the wrong way, but President Obama was president, and he was, he was uh, glorifying the uh, Supreme Court decision of letting people get married there, men to men and women to women. Remember this? And I got up in front of the chapel. Well, I was fired up that day. <clears throat> Actually, they complained. They sent something to my commander. Nothing happened to me, so I was okay. I said, look, to the congregation, I don't care. The president of the United States says whatever he wants to say. The president of the United States is not God. The president of the United States doesn't tell me what to do. It is God Almighty, and I will stand before him and anybody else and tell him the word of God and the truth. You know what? God, God made one man, and he made one woman, and that was the model for all eternity. If it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. Well, I got in trouble. But I'll say it again. Here's the thing. If God tells you to do something, do it. It may not make any sense. He may lead you to the Red Sea, and you may have been stuck there, and you see the Egyptian army coming. You're going, what do I do now? The Lord wants to be glorified in our lives. And so sometimes he'll put us in positions, become warriors of God, to see and test us whether or not we're going to trust in him or trust in, him, in ourselves. And it's time, ladies and gentlemen, that we stand up as the church of Jesus Christ and tell the world, you will not come any further. This is it. We're going to part the Red Sea. We're moving forward, and we're going to give God the honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen and amen. Go ahead, Dad. Since we're talking about Moses and part the Red Sea, I wonder if you had uh, something to say. <laughs> Exactly what did you have in mind? <laughs> well, there's nothing like being put on the spot for having your name Moses. Um, well, I uh, see that uh, Moses uh, was clearly uh, a man that God prepared for that moment uh, to know God in such a way that he could speak and see an absolute miracle take place. Um, I have seen God part the Red Sea for me. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Tell him. How many have you, how many have ever been uh, headed down a path where you're going to be run over by the ocean and uh, circumstances and wiped out. Uh, so um, as I have gone through life, I've experienced tremendous success through God and in ministry. And so I mentioned to you this morning that I pastored the First Baptist Church of Los Gatos, and uh, I... Uh, died and burned, <laughs> and I just left it out there for you to have it out in the air. <laughs> so at a place uh, in my life where I had it all, I was connected with uh, everyone, uh, Billy Graham, uh, with uh, my church growing and uh, with my life just absolutely phenomenal. And as I sat by my pool on Saturday morning drinking coffee, uh, the Lord said to me, if I take everything that you have from you, will you still serve me? And I said, yes. <laughs> and then... Uh, that was a particular time I was teaching the book of Ephesians, and I was 
at the passage uh, that says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came into my office. And I sat there and I said, I want to sit, I want this for eternity. I just want to sit here forever. This is the most wonderful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And then I said, I know there's an inner circle and I want in. And so, in a matter of about three months, my entire world collapsed. As I was serving communion on Sunday morning, the Holy Spirit told me my wife was in an affair. So I went home and I told her what had happened and what I received that day. And uh, she said, uh, yes, several. <laughs> and uh, so I then proceeded to try to go see a counselor with her and seek uh, reconciliation. And I found that it could not happen. And so I then brought my deacons together and uh, I told them my situation. And there was dead silence in the room. They were all in total shock and they just all filed out. Uh, then I proceeded to pastor the church uh, as a single person and um, things were going for the church great. A chairman of my board took me aside at a work day. He said, if you do not reconcile your marriage, I want you to turn your resignation in. And I said, uh, now, reviewing all these things, uh, you think it's things you would do at certain times, but I feel everything that took place in my life was, a, was the Lord walking me through a process. So I then had papers filed on me, and uh, I did resign and uh, stepped away. Now... The interesting thing about it back then, and this is years ago, this is 40 years ago, divorce was not in the church. <laughs> Pastors were not getting divorced. So it was something that absolutely was just unbelievable for any church to deal with. Uh, so I uh, resigned. Uh, I then, we sold everything we which today in the real estate of California would be about $4 million. And, uh, and then I went and uh, lived in a trailer. And uh, so for eight months, I told God what to do. I was in a constant argument with God every day as my life was standing still, no doors opening, no job, and bills and so forth. And uh, things getting worse. And a, a little, a young girl and a young boy. That young boy is a pastor today, that young girl is married to a pastor today. Uh, my total commitment at that time was to my kids, just to stay with them and be with them and go into the, uh, what, what was the place you'd go in and play those games back then? Arcade. I would just go with my kids to the arcade and stand there, <laughs> Quit, keep putting quarters in. Okay, so I got to the uh, place that uh, I saw no light, saw nothing getting better, but only worse. So I'm in my apartment and I'm, again, telling God what to do. 
I've been doing it for eight months. The Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, Jerry, if you'll judge yourself for as long as you live, uh, excuse me, if you'll forgive everybody the past, the present, and the future, and judge yourself only for as long as you live, I'll make a way for you. That was 360 in what I was telling God to do. <laughs> and so I then said to the Lord, I, oh, excuse me, I fell prostrate immediately. That word was so powerful. I am flat on the floor. And I say to the Lord, I know I'm saved. I have no question whatsoever I'm coming home when I die. But I question that you love me and you must prove it to me for me to keep getting up and going on. I want a job and I want it in 24 hours. And I was in a little studio. And so 14 hours from that prayer, the phone rang in my studio. A total stranger called me and offered me a sales position, giving me a new car, giving me salary, giving me a bonus, giving me full benefits. And uh, I said, uh, well, when do I report to work? And uh, but there was something further that took place in my heart. I knew that I knew that I knew God loved me. And we can move the heart of God in our lives here on the earth as a sympathetic savior. And so then I uh, went on in that job the uh, man who hired me and his wife, we held a Bible study in their home, and then I trained in uh, high-rise glass sales in the Bay Area and in Southern California. And I found that God gave me the gift of selling. <laughs> and uh, it was sort of extremely successful. Then I went, my, the man that hired me, uh, the company, when they, initially when they hired me, because I'm a minister, they gave him so much trouble that he quit and he moved to Southern California with his wife. And uh, my job was flying down there, so I took him out to dinner and I said, listen, I need you to pray for me. I need a wife. And, they, and uh, she, Dee, said to Tom, Tom, I know the girl. Her name is Carol. She's a sales girl that calls on our company. Tom, arrange a blind date with Jerry and Carol. Now, I'm a pastor all these years, and I'm just not quite there where I can think blind date. So I, uh, I, at first I'm thinking, I don't know how this is going to work. <laughs> so I uh, started calling Dee as she was going to do this, asking her how are things going for this arrangement, and uh, she would tell me more and more about Carol, but they could not get the date set. So after, I think, two months of doing this, I said to her, give me Carol's work number. I called her on the phone. I said, are Tom and Dee giving you a bad time about me? If she said, yes, I go, I just want to apologize. Have a good day. <laughs> but uh, she said no. So I said, uh, well, we, well I'd, I'd like to come out and take you to dinner. So we came down, and we went out to dinner together. Uh, that was, and uh, in exactly two months from that night, we got married. And we've been married for 38 years. And she has been with me uh, as my better half. Right, men? Our better half. 
If you don't know that, you better get it from me right now. <laughs> and uh, it's been teaming up with Carol that has brought me into all that my future held. And uh, uh, so it's been an extremely exciting life. And it's, uh, we've got four kids married, eight kids, uh, 12 grandkids, three great grandkids. And uh, God is able in my life and in yours. He's a God of miracles. is going on <clears throat> and then you get to ring the bell if you want to let me ask you let me tell you something y'all don't ring the bell in your life don't ring the bell because the lord will help you through if you don't give up and so um the, the train as you fight we put troops in difficult training cycles and brother i gotta tell you the lord puts you through that cycle to train you up to get you battle ready, to get you to a place where you could be used by God and look what's going on in your life. It's the same with me, same with Troy, and the same with all of you. That we will go through testing in our life. We will go through chaos. We will go through different. Don't expect tomorrow morning or Monday morning you get up that you're going to be, you know, all ready. everything's going to be hunky-dory. It's not going to be hunky-dory, okay? But you have the Lord. And everything's going to be okay. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. What does that tribulation mean? You're going to have trouble. But he said, be of good cheer. Have joy. Have the life of the Lord. Because, because of that, because I have overcome the world. The Lord, We are in the Lord's hands. And at the end of the day, we are all believers going to be with him forever and ever. So, training is important. And so... Here are the military uh, planning. Uh, you can have the best plans in the world. It doesn't mean a hill of beans because those plans are going to change when the enemy starts shooting. We have, a, we have a maxim. I want you to write this down. The enemy gets a vote. Okay? In your life, the enemy gets... And what that means is when the battle starts and you have all these wonderful plans going on, <laughs> things start going awry when the enemy starts shooting back at you, okay? That's what he means, the enemy gets a vote. It could be in the physical realm, it could be in the spiritual realm, it could be in the financial realm, it could be in the relational, if the enemy is going to get a vote in your life. So, you know, we have practices. So here's where I want to go with all this before we go, before we get to the break. 
we want you to train as you fight. So what did Admiral McRaven say? Does anybody know what Admiral McRaven say? If you want to change the world, what you should do? You can't say it because you already know the answer. Does anybody know? Yeah. Admiral McRaven, to this group of Austin graduates, said, if you want to win the world, learn how to fix your bed. <laughs> I'm going to say that again because some of you didn't get it. If you want to change the world, if you want to be successful, if you want to be really learn how to make your bed, what in the world does that mean? Because Admiral McGraven said the same thing. He went through SEAL training, and the first thing they said, okay, we're going to teach you how to make your bed. Well, I didn't join the military to learn how to fix my bed. I joined the military to learn how to fight. And they looked at him and said, if you can't do the small things, you're not going to do the big things. If you can't discipline yourself every day to do what you're supposed to do, then you can't really be an effective warrior in the military or for God. What I'm saying, I'm going to translate this to you all. You know where I'm going with this? It's in the little things every day that we do that turn out to be the great things in our lives. Example, prayer. You know, you all want to be prayer warriors? Well, let me ask you a question. How much are you praying? How often are you praying? When are you praying? Where are you praying? Someone that's come up to me, one of the gentlemen here, was talking about prayer. He says, you know, we always reserve prayer for emergencies. No, we should be praying every minute and every day, every possibility. Lord, help me do this. What do you want me to do here? What shall I do here? This job, this person. Do you want me to witness to that person? What is it you want me to do, Holy Spirit? Lord, Jesus, Father. The little things every moment of every day. Now, I play the saxophone. I didn't bring it today. I probably have 20,000 plus hours of practice, Pastor. Um, and someone considered me a great saxophone player. I, and I've got my degree in saxophone performance from Sacramento State University. And, um, and I performed all around the world. And hopefully next time I come, you know, if we uh, are invited back, I'll bring the saxophone. But you know what I learned? You can't be great on the saxophone or any instrument until you put the amount of practice to become great. You cannot be great on in anything unless you put the time into it. Now, you may be a genius and, you know, Mozart picked up the violin at the age 12, never practiced before, and played in his father's quartet. But that's one in a trillion people, okay? <laughs> but thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice and rehearsal and timing are required to be a great military warrior, to be a great musician, and to be a great Christian. You know, a lot of people say, how do you become a great Christian? you got to want to, you know, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, it says this. Those that diligently follow hard after God, God will acknowledge. Basically, that's what the translation says in Hebrews. That you follow hard after God, then God will reward you for that going hard after him. Well, that's the question in war, in the fog of war, and in, in our practice. And we'll talk more about this after the break in boot camp, the same thing. And I'll tell you some of my, you know, boot camp experiences. But the fact of the matter is, if you're in the fog of war and you wait on the Lord and you start marching to the sound of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find your place in, in, in God that's going to be successful. So if you want to be successful, learn how to make your bed. And actually, we've done this conference, Pastor, i got to tell you, the day after we said all of this, some people came up and said, I, I said, what is the first thing you guys did today? Someone raised their hand. I said, I, I made my bed. <laughs> it's not about making your bed, but there's a point to what we're saying here. It's in the little things. Someone came up to a friend of mine and said, hey, I want to be the, a CEO of a great corporation. He was giving this big lecture on being successful. He said, I want to be the CEO. And he says, well, let me see your garage. He goes, what? He says, let me see your garage. What does that have to do with being a great CEO? He said, if you can't organize your house, you can't organize a big company. Ouch. That hurts a lot. Troy, what do you got to add to, to that, man? 
Oh, I, I, I just add that uh, my dad was a, a Korean War veteran, and um, you know he, he ran a PT boat in the Korean War and told us all these all these war stories as a kid. I remember all, all these great memories of watching war movies with my dad. But he did. He made me make my bed every every day when I was a little kid. It, it had a it was like the, the dime toss on it. Oh yeah. The dime has to bounce off your. Your bed. dad was a great drill so sergeant. Oh oh yeah. yeah. He was, <laughs> they, they called him God in my hometown. Uh, but anyways, so I had to make my bed. He put me to work sleeping in the cannery floors when I was seven years old. I think at age nine, I started backing shrimp, wow. picking, picking shrimp with the they had like this big shrimp machine. I had to mow the lawn, cut the firewood. I had to weed the garden, plant the garden, harvest the wow. garden. My, my, <laughs> and then I was in sports. I was in youth group. So, you know, the whole, the whole childhood was, you know, sort of training and uh, – and uh, you know, I never really complained about it. Cause my older brothers, had, you know, they're about six, seven years older, so they were already gone. But I, I think all that, you know, you, you do those little, little things, and then you know, God will use that l later on in your life, to, you know, for for bigger things. Yeah. Well, we have just a few minutes, moments before we break. Um, don't let me forget to tell the story of the my track team when we start the next session. That is hilarious. But it talks. It's going to talk about our next our next subject. But before we go there, um, questions about this particular subject or anything you've heard today or anything you wanted to uh, question about, things you're afraid to ask, you know. Um, but are there any questions, comments, concerns before we go to our dessert? Anybody? De you have, we've answered every question you've ever had. Yes, ma'am. A comment. Hold on, but the microphone's coming to you. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> I'm, I'm plenty loud. <laughs> my dad always checked the corners of my bed. Because he was military, too. Yes. Yeah, in the military, that's the first thing they do is yeah. check the corners of yeah. your bed. And then they throw a dime on it. If it doesn't bounce up, right. guess, bounce up guess what you get to do? You, you get to make, make it all it over bit. again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was a good comment. Yeah, the corners of your bed. Or, you know, like my wife does, she goes underneath the bed to see if there's any dust. And she vacuums, yeah. Yes, ma'am, waving back. There's a, Jerry, pastor? There's someone way back there. Oh, okay. I agree. I agree. Yeah, you check, you check for Amen. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> there was someone who was asked, yes, ma'am, right here. Well, hold on. There's a microphone coming. So, the whole section on the fog of war. On what? The fog of war. Yes, ma'am. That just seems like something we're going through right now. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely. mean, we don't know. That's why we need to know the Bible and what it says, because we don't know what's happening. We, we, there's all the theories, and we can study and listen to people, but we don't know. And sometimes, I don't know about everybody else, but I feel a little bit crazy sometimes. And I know friends think, oh, you're crazy. But we don't know what's happening. We can't see. And thank you for coming so that way I don't feel so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got news for you. I don't know either. But I do know someone who does know. I'll follow them every time. We have a, a question, uh, room for one more question or comment before we go. Okay. Pastor, it's all yours, brother. Oh, we have someone. We have one more. I was just going to ask, Troy, uh, are earthquakes considered something we should be watching? Earthquakes and volcanoes that are occurring in m large numbers? Mount your uh, microphone, brother. Yeah. Or do they have your microphone? Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the Bible does talk about an increase in uh, earthquakes and natural disasters and that kind of thing. And there's actually, I've read, read different studies that say that the, the no, not only the number, but the intensity of these mega disasters has been increasing, especially over the last decade or two. And, you know, of course, we, we live here where the San Andreas could, you know, could erupt. It's uh, 150 years overdue. And uh, there's all kinds of, you know, the, the, the ring of fire, all these volcanoes we're seeing. You know, th these very well could be signs that we're moving into this period of time. So yeah, we're we're seeing a lot of that. Just, you know, I, I try I try to keep up on the on the news on all that, but there's so much of it now. It's it's hard to hard to track it all. So yeah. After the next session, when we start after the break, it'll be the center of gravity. You don't want to miss that. 
Okay, how many of you have actually been enjoying the sessions? All right.